Let's turn to Genesis chapter 13 this morning together, will you? Turn with me, please. Genesis chapter 13. Last week, when we looked at chapter 12, we discovered that this man who is called the father of faith, Abram, had authentic faith. And that ought to resonate with every, every person, because I'm telling you, the just shall live by faith. You claim to be a believer, faith ought to be a big thing in your life. Faith ought to be authentic as it was in this man's life. But remember, human beings don't have perfect faith. And Abram's faith lapsed. But you know what I like? When you turn to chapter 13, he goes back. His faith failed, but he went back to the altar that he had left behind. You know what I want you and I to to get by way of encouragement from that is this. Failure in your Christian life, in your spiritual life, never needs to be final. It never needs to be a permanent thing. God always is waiting for his people to come back to him to do a 180, and to return to him. And it all really is about personal choices that we make. I read that it's estimated that the average person makes 70 choices every day. That's, you know, almost like 26,000 a year, and uh, in an average lifespan, almost 2 million choices. Well... I think that's the reason why you're here. I believe that your life is the sum of all your choices that you've made. And the reason you are where you are, and the reason that you're doing what you're doing is because of the choices that you make. And the big difference that I want to point out in this chapter is, What is the difference between a godly choice and a worldly choice, a selfish choice, a fleshly choice? I have a caution here, and it's this. You're free to make choices, but you're not free to choose the consequences that come from them. And I'm telling you, Some of the consequences of choices that we make are huge. They're very important at times. So I want us to pause for prayer and then look at this passage and see what God has for us here. Heavenly Father, we pause and we thank you. We ask that you would teach our hearts through the scripture this morning how we need to hear from you. We need, Lord, for you to show us what it is that you want us to get and take away from this. I pray that we wouldn't be forgetful hearers, that it would register in our hearts and that we would live it as we depend upon you for the power to do so. Lord, thank you for Abram. He's such a wonderful case study in really what it means to walk with the Lord and be a friend of God. I pray that you might... uh, cause the focus to be on you and not on men. Right? We just leave here a changed people, brought into a relationship with you and into a closer walk with you. We'd be happy, Lord, for you to do that as we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you look at the first seven verses, which we won't read all of them because we already did, what you will find in those first seven verses is, if put in one word, strife. You find contention. You find a discontentedness. You find relational problems, family problems. You know, that's real life. Problems in relationships, that's really real life. That's what life uh, really 
amounts to so often. But I want you to note what caused it. If you look in verse 2, it says, Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And then if you look over with me in this uh, same chapter, I think it's uh, verse 5, it says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tent, uh, tents. You know what that tells me? That indicates that one of the main reasons for relationship problems is money and things, money and possessions, wealth, if I could just use that word. It's the increasing of livestock that created a shortage of the good grazing land that caused fights between the shepherds of Abram and the shepherds of Lot. They were competing for the resources because the, when you're in the desert, there's not a whole lot of green grass for your flocks to uh, graze on. And so they're in competition uh, for resources, and that leads to tension between the families. I think fractured family relationships could most often be traced back to possessions and money. Kids fighting over the inheritance left to them by their parents. Uh, Whatever. But here's something that I want you to, to think about as well. You know, we're a family. We're a spiritual family. And uh, life is messy. And relationships sometimes are troublesome. People are different from us, and people don't always do things uh, the way we do, nor the right way. And in a spiritual family, as in a biological family, you can have fractures because of things like this. For instance, Let's say that someone does work for you that is also a brother in Christ and doesn't do a good job or doesn't uh, complete the job and uh, maybe you pay them up front. Well, that's a potential fracture there, isn't it? What does Paul tell us? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and uh, the first eight verses, basically he says this, look, If you have a problem with a spiritual family member, there comes a point where it's not worth fracturing a church over. It's not worth splitting a church. Why don't you rather take it and suffer loss and just give it to the Lord and move on and put it behind you? Don't take them to court. You realize how that would dirty the testimony of the Lord if you take uh, the business that was contracted and that caused the fracture in a spiritual family before the world and let them hear and see all your dirty laundry? Just give it to God and see if God will not take care of you despite the loss. Now that's a Christian attitude. And that's what, uh, that's what we're instructed to do. Don't let possessions and money become the driving force in your life because strife develops around that when that becomes all too important. But here's another thing that I want to pull out of this strife that's going on in these first seven verses, and that is that it all is a matter of your human will. Okay? It's... Uh, The will is you exercising choices. Uh, Choices that you make are an exercise of your human will. And that will always set the stage for a battle between the wills. A battle between your will and someone else's will. And uh, whose will is going to be followed? Abraham chose to return to God's will, and he got right with God, which, of course, involves repentance, 
repentance is really turning around. So he, he actually turned in an opposite direction, left Egypt, literally, and uh, went uh, north, back into Israel. I know the Bible says south, but that simply means the Negev, which is north of the country of Egypt. Okay, And so he's, uh, he's turned back to God's will. He's, what Abram is doing is he's exchanging God's will for his own will. And when you do that, you do the right thing. When you exchange God's will for, you, for your will, it involves surrender on your part. It involves you putting up the white flag and saying, okay, God, I surrender. I want your will more than I want mine. And when you surrender to the Lord and you take his will, you get right with God, it involves confession as well. It involves you saying, Lord, I'm wrong, you're right. And you agree with him. And that is always followed by obedient steps of action. Obedient action. Listen to me. You don't really surrender to the Lord until you obey the Lord and take the, the steps that he wants you to take. It's not just saying, okay, God, I'll do what you want me to do. It's then doing it. It's then taking those steps of obedient action. And that is all part of the human will. And that is all part of what uh, Paul's talking about in Romans 12 in that famous passage when he says, based upon all God's goodness, all God's grace and mercy in your life, give yourselves, present yourselves totally to God. Be a living sacrifice to God so that what? So that you can prove out his will in your life. So that you can do the will of God. Surrender involves doing God's will. Or it's not real surrender. Strife. It involves wealth here. It involves the will. It also involves worship. Look at it. In uh, verse 4, and uh, I think it's the second part of that uh, fourth verse, when Abram finally does return, uh, it says he went back to where he had been at the first, and it says there Abram called on the name of the Lord. He called on the name of the Lord. He returned to the place where he left God behind. And by virtue of the fact that he called upon the name of the Lord, he was back in fellowship with God. Because when he went down to Egypt, he walked out of fellowship with God. Because God didn't lead him to go to Egypt. God led him to Canaan. And he left Canaan because of the circumstances, the famine, and he went down to Egypt, walked out of the will of God. Now he's back in the will of God, and he's back in fellowship with God. He's calling upon the name of the Lord. Again, failure never needs to be permanent. In your walk with God, you should realize that the Christian life really, if I can put it this way, is a series of new beginnings. I'm always starting over again. I'm always starting fresh. Because I realize that when I admit and when I own my wrongdoing, my sin, I can get forgiveness and it gets wiped clean so that I have a fresh start. I have a new beginning. I do that every day. I end up having a new beginning all the time. And so can you. And uh, that's the wonderful thing. But I want you also, not only to see strife in this 13th chapter, but I want you to see the solution to it. And uh, we pick that up in verses 8 through verse 13. Again, I'm not going to read them all. But uh, I would say this, that the way that Abram handles the strife is a real solution. And it tells me that relational problems can be solved by you and I making godly choices, by you and I making godly decisions. And look at what motivated him to make this right choice. He says to his nephew Lot in verse 8, he said, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my shepherds and your shepherds. Why? For we're brethren. They're brethren. In other words, 
I want this to end. I don't want there to be bad feelings between us because we're brothers. We share a common bond. Now, doesn't that make sense when it comes to a local church like this? That there should not be strife between a brother and another brother or a sister and another sister, or brothers and sisters. There should not be strife. Why? Because we're all members of the same family. We're all members of God's family. I shouldn't think evil of you. You shouldn't think evil of me, because we're all in the same family. You know, it doesn't matter who we are, what our backgrounds are, what our nationality is. It's we're the same spiritual family. And so we're brothers, And so don't let this strife remain. And the solution that he comes up with, uh, motivated by that family membership they shared, is really deferential. He defers to Lot, which is really amazing. Because who did God speak to? And who did God promise the land to? Abram. And who's older here? And yet this... This man, this old man, 75 years old, that wasn't old perhaps in that day, but it is to to me. (laughs) He defers to a young man. He's very deferential. Look it. You know what? We as believers need to learn how to let God lead us concerning our actions. Instead of just figuring out ourselves and taking matters into our own hands, we need to... We need to learn how to let God lead us in the actions that we take. There is a time for, instead of pushing for your rights, that you defer to others and you yield your rights to the Lord. And in doing so, you yield your rights to others. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 is a passage that uh, I had in mind and I wanted to have marked. We got very close to it uh, this morning. But Philippians chapter 2, the first four verses, here's what Paul says, If there be any comfort, consolation in Messiah, in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, hey, we have that as believers in Christ. Any bowels and mercies, fulfill my joy that you be like-minded having the same love being of one accord and of one mind. Why? Because we all love the same Lord. We're all worshiping the same person. We're all part of the same family. Look at verse 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife. That's what we saw in Abram and uh, Lot and their herdsmen, their shepherds. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory and pride and arrogance but rather in humility, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem or value others better than they value themselves. Put it simply, put others before yourself. Think of others instead of yourself. Be more concerned with other people instead of your own things. In fact, he says in verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but look every man on the things of others. And what he means is, don't be concerned with your stuff. Be concerned with the stuff of others. In other words, be a blessing. Defer to others. Be unselfish is what he... Be deferential. Be selfless. Don't live for yourself, but rather live for others is what he's saying here. I see in Abram sacrificial generosity. And that's a sign of faith. That's a sign of real faith when you are sacrificing to be generous. That's real faith. That's saying, God, you know, if you want me to give this, I know that you're going to take care of me, so it's okay, I can give it. The opposite, selfish grasping, is unbelief. It really is. If, if, if people are selfishly grasping for themselves, it just reveals that they're full of unbelief. They don't have real faith in the Lord. Lot's choice was totally selfish. We'll see it in a moment. The Bible says that he, well, let's just look at it. In the uh, ninth verse, um, 
Abram says, look, the whole land's before you. You choose. He defers. He's deferential. You choose, Lot. I'm going to give you that opportunity. Verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld. Note that phrase. He lifted up his eyes and beheld. And what did he see? He saw a lush, fruitful uh, piece of land, the Jordan Valley. Oh, that looked the most fertile to him. And that was the peace that he wanted for himself. Unbelief grasps, but faith gives. And by the way, he grasped at the best. But when you read the rest of the story, which we won't enter into today, but we'll see it later on in the book of Genesis, what he grasped was short-lived. In the end, it, it didn't come out well for him. He's selfish. You know what? Grasping like that is a sign of immaturity. You want the biggest. You want the best for yourself. It's like a kid wanting the biggest piece. You know, there's still adults that still always take the biggest piece on the plate for themselves. That's a childish thing. I mean, you, you put... Uh, you put homemade cookies on a plate and offer a group of children each one cookie and they're going to take their time looking over the plate seeing who can which is the biggest cookie and the guy that has the first choice will take the biggest cookie it, it happens invariably that's how kids are it's a big sign of immaturity to be selfish and to be grasping, but it's also a sign of, of unbelief in a, in, a, in a Christian life. He's deferential. But I want you also to think about this. In the solution that Abram brings to the table for this strife, not only is he deferential, but he is looking at the eternal. He's a man walking by faith and not by sight. Lot is just walking by sight. He's just taking in what he can see, and that's what he wants. Abram is walking by faith. He's, he's walking based upon what God's told him, what God has promised him. And so he's not focused on the temporal, and he's not focused just on the visible, but he's focused rather on the eternal and the invisible. Abram's choice is really proof of what is said about him, this man of faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, that his focus was not on an earthly city, his focus was not on an earthly country or land, but on a better country and on a heavenly city. He's eternally focused. Look, when we are focused on the temporal, on what we can see, that always fosters greed and grasping and pride and manipulation in order to get it, and at the end you really you don't have a good feeling, and it, it spawns bad feelings generally in other people's lives as well. People don't feel good about people that are grasping. Abram, he's deferential, his focus is eternal, and what I see here in what he says to his nephew in verse 9, I see what I call a transferal. What, what do I mean by that? That this older man is willing to relinquish his, his right to choose because God promised the land to him. He's willing to relinquish his right to choose to let God choose for him what's best. To trust God to watch out for his interests. Hey, does that characterize you? Are you at the point in your walk with the Lord that the pressure's off of you having to choose and you're fine with letting God choose because you believe that when he does, he's going to choose in your best interest and he knows what's best for you more than you do? I'm often reminded and pray when I'm reminded of the words of the uh, writer of Proverbs where he says, feed me 
with food that is convenient for me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but feed me with food that is convenient with me. Lord, you know what my needs are. Just meet my needs as you've promised you would. Seek ye first, Jesus said, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and guess what? You don't have to worry about things. Everything you need will be given. He'll supply, will be added unto you. I'm also reminded of a little boy and his mother that went into a store, and when mother was checking out, the clerk went under the counter and pulled out a big bowl of little dum-dums, you know, the lollipops. And uh, the clerk said, here, son, just help yourself. Take a handful of those lollipops. And a little boy just, you know, shied away and, uh, and wouldn't do it. And uh, finally, uh, the clerk said, okay, and just grabbed a handful and gave uh, the boy the lollipops. When they got outside the store, the mom said to her son, you're not that shy. Why did you do that? Why didn't you take the lollipops when they were offered to you? And he said, because he had a bigger hand than I do. <laughs> Let me tell you, God has a bigger hand than you do. And God is able, because he promises, to supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God always gives his best, someone said, to them that leave the choice to him. The solution to strife. And then, look at how God solaces Abram. Just really confirms and calms his heart. In verse 14, the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up thine eyes and look. Now I want you to see that phrase. And compare it to the phrase uh, in verse 10. Because what God instructed Abram to do, lift up and look, is the same words and same construction of what Lot did when he was making his selfish choice. He lifted up his eyes and he beheld. And God tells Abram, do the same thing. Lift up your eyes and behold and look. The difference is that Lot took, whereas Abram was given, and he received a greater inheritance and a, and, and a great, a vast number of descendants. Look at what God says to him. He says in, in verse 15, all the land which you see to thee will I give it. And guess what? That land that he could see was the land that Lot had chosen. In other words, I'm going to give you Lot's land. Eventually, I'm going to give that to your descendants. So it's all right. And then in verse 16, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. I'm going to give you so many descendants, you can't count them. You can't count them. God confirms here in Abram's heart that he did the right thing. He made the right choice. He made a godly choice. God makes that very clear to him. He promises him abundance, basically. You know, it's unnecessary for you and I to cling to things, to grasp for things, to try to get things from people, to try to get things free. So go by the school and grab a lunch. <laughs> I did that just for fun. One day I walked, and they were giving out free lunches at the school, and I brought one home to my wife and I, and uh, I said, here, we get free food. Not going to do that. I don't need to do that. God meets my needs. I don't need the state to take care of me. I don't need New York City to take care of my needs. I have a God that's much bigger than they are. But anyway, that's off the point. My point is simply this. God promised abundance to this man. 
And it's unnecessary for me to cling to things because God's looking out for me. God's looking out for you. Do you get that? God is looking out for your interest, and he has more, he has, he has more interest in your interest than you do. And he can well take care. Look, you can trust God's amazing plan. Simple as that. You can trust God's amazing plan. Just keep asking, and he'll keep giving. That's the way he is, he's arranged it. So he confirms. But look at verse 18. We're getting almost to the end here. Then Abram removed his tent. God tells him in verse 17, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I'm going to give it to you. He had him look northward, southward, eastward, and westward in all four directions. And then he says, now get up and walk through that land because in every direction that you've looked, I'm going to give it to you. Verse 18, so Abram did. He followed through in obedient steps of faith. Abram removed his tent and came, and he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. What I see happening here is Abram claiming what God confirmed to him. Literally, removed his tent, literally is Abram tented. He tented. In other words, he kept moving from place to place, staking his claim uh, of the land that God promised him. You know, as believers, we have been... We have been given infinite spiritual riches and inheritance. Blessings in heavenly places that can't be that, that can't be numbered. We have promised to us all things that relate to, pertain to life here and now and the godliness that is necessary. All of that is part of our inheritance and our provision in Christ. But you know what? It does you no good if you don't tent if you don't state your claim, if you don't go from promise to promise and state your claim, you know what you need to do? You need to walk through the Bible as a believer and discover your possessions in Christ and then state your claim on those promises, on those possessions, by taking what God has promised you by faith. And that is the key, folks, to living a victorious and abundant life in Christ. It's claiming, it's staking, your, uh, it's staking your claim on the promises of God's abundant life. Your faith really determines the level of blessing that you'll enjoy as a believer. And then one final thing in the second part of that 18th verse, basically, he settles down. He's made all, he staked his claim, so now he settles down in a place called Hebron. By the way, that's where he's buried. Uh, uh, it's under Palestinian authority, and so it's really not safe to go there, but uh, I've been there. I've been at, at Abram's burial place. It's, it's amazing. And other patriarchs buried there as well. But what I want you to see here, God confirms, he claims, and then you know what that ends up being? Contentment. He's now content. He settles down. He chooses to settle down and resides there. He's at rest. He's at rest. And he builds an altar there. He, he, he comes into fellowship and he worships there. You know what the Christian life is? It's simply a choice to enter into spiritual rest. To settle down and to reside in Christ who resides in you through his spirit. The Christian life is a life of rest. And you enter into that rest when you stop, when you cease trying to work for your salvation and you just trust what Jesus already has fully accomplished for you when he gave his life and shed his blood and rose again from the dead. He offers you forgiveness and all of these spiritual provisions that are part of your inheritance. And by the way, if you're a believer and you think that you have to do things in order to uh, keep yourself in good graces with God, you haven't entered into the rest that he intends you to have. You enter into that rest 
when you trust the Lord that saved you to keep you, when you realize, you know what? Jesus is enough. There's nothing I can add to what he's done. He's enough. And you can say as Paul, I have learned to be content with such things as I have, and I can do all things through Christ who constantly infuses his strength into me. If I had to pick a favorite song of Abram, I would say perhaps he would choose, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord." And he would continue, I'm so glad I've learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me and will be with me to the end. That would be Abe's favorite psalm. But you know, I want to contrast that with ungodly, worldly, selfish, carnal decisions. You know what their theme song is? Old Frankie baby. I did it my way. I did it my way. Here's the words. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain, my friend. I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway and more, and much more than this, I did it my way. Another verse of that song. For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. Yes, it was my way. Well, that is the way of the world. That is a theme song of worldly choices. That is the the poem that describes carnal, fleshly, selfish living that lives only for the here and now. And by the way, I believe that Lot was truly a believer. When I read the New Testament, I get that impression clearly. But I'm telling you what, he never entered into rest. He was never a victorious believer. He lived a defeated, a defeated believing life. And Lot not only messed up his life, but you know what hurts? He messed up his whole family. When you make ungodly, selfish, carnal, fleshly decisions, you ruin your family and not just yourself. You say, I don't have any family. Well, then you ruin other people, your friends. I don't have any friends. Well, you ruin whoever follows your example then, and you don't know who they might be. You remember what happened to old Lot? He got drunk. And he entered into an incestuous relationship with his daughters. And one of the babies that was born from that immoral relationship was named Moab. And the people that came from Moab, called, of course, the Moabites, were a very wicked pagan people, and they were the sworn enemies of Israel. But you know what happens? God took a Moabitess woman who came to believe in the God of Israel and brought her into a marriage relationship with a godly Israeli man, an Israelite man, and together they produced a child and became the grandparents of King David and were put into the line of Jesus the Messiah himself. Bad choices are extremely costly, folks. But here's some hope I want to leave you with. God can, and he will, redeem our choices when we turn to him. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you might use these words to just convict and to 
turn and change our hearts that we would make godly choices and not carnal, fleshly, worldly ones. Thank you for Abram, this man of God, imperfect as he was, and yet a man who loved you and wanted to please you. And Lord, you just, you used him greatly. We're saved today because of this man. Because as you've promised, so it has come true and will continue in the future. You bless all the nations of the earth through this man's faith obedience. I pray for any here or any listening in that have never come into that rest of depending upon Jesus alone for salvation, that they would do so today. And those of us who are believers, that we would rest in Jesus and let him have his way in our life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.